From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. We're going to start today with a check on the markets. We said they're moving, particularly the equity markets, and not in a good way, at least if you own those equities. Joining us now to take us through the markets is Bloomberg's Abigail Doodle. So, Abigail, as I say, there's a lot of red here as I'm looking at the Bloomberg. There certainly is. It's a bit of a rough day for equity longs, and this after a nice rally day yesterday. But right now we have the S&P 500 down 2.8 percent, the Nasdaq 100 down 3.6 percent, the Dow Transport down more than 5%, the worst day since June of 2020. Much of this has to do, of course, with Target. Target plunging down more than 24%. They put up a, a quarter, which is very interesting because consumer demand was there. They beat sales, but earnings, a massive miss on operating art margins really coming in. So this conversation that we've been having for months and months, will companies be able to manage inflation? We now have two big box retailers telling us inflation is unmanageable. And I guess, Abigail, it's hard to know, but I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit. Is it because sometimes that happens, you have a couple of big stocks move and it takes others with them? Or is there something more fundamental, perhaps, really worried about margins as we have this inflation really hit the cost side that makes them worry about earnings more generally than just beyond retailers? Well, I think that some investors may be thinking, because this clearly is not priced in, that's what's sort of so stunning about it. And for Target, CEO Brian Cornell saying that they were really caught off guard. But Wall Street, I mean, we've been, again, talking about this for months. And even with that, you have the stock down 24 percent, not priced in at all. If these are two of the best managed companies out there are other companies going to have an issue? It reminds me a little bit of 2000, 2001, when companies, and I'm thinking more about technology, but companies simply could not manage and the expectations kept going on. It was a long period of volatility. But another macro issue, of course, the Fed, and yesterday, Jay Powell, Fed Chair Jay Powell, he was his most hawkish ever, saying that they're willing to do whatever it takes. They'll even bring the rate above neutral if needed. Stocks didn't react yesterday, but sometimes we have delayed reactions. Plus, we're in this brutal downtrend of a year. So anything bearish, you yeah. know, it really seems to kick up the selling. Yeah, well, we shall see, but it's not very encouraging at the moment. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. It's not just the markets where there's drama being played out. There's also drama being played out right here in the state of New York as we have last-minute redistricting efforts that are really throwing things up in a turmoil. And we're going to welcome now Democratic Con Representative Hakeem Jeffries of New York. Congressman Jeffries serves as the chair of the Democratic Caucus. Congressman, thank you for joining us. I want to start out with something that I saw, a quote from you. We'll put the tweet up, it was, for, uh, for our TV audiences. But the main thing was, I, I saw you said it would make Jim Crow blush. Explain what you meant by that. Well, thank you for having me on. We are in the middle of uh, a redistricting cycle, of course, which occurs every 10 years. And our objective from the very beginning was simply fair maps that would allow the people of New York State the ability to choose the representative of their choice over the next 10 years to represent them in Congress for such an important time as this. Unfortunately, as a result of a flawed process that was put forth by the New York State Court of Appeals, uh, we were stuck with a special master and a judicial overseer based in Steuben County who have conducted uh, a process with respect to these maps that have left out the voices of downstate New Yorkers generally and specifically communities of color. As a result, the draft map that was released on Monday degraded the black population in four different congressional districts. The one represented by Greg Meeks, the one represented by Yvette Clark, the one represented by Jamal Bowman, and the one that I currently represent anchored in central Brooklyn. It also degraded the Latino population uh, in the district currently represented by Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez, removing many neighborhoods that she has represented ably for 30 years. That's just the beginning, David, and it's highly problematic. So, Congressman, I can attest to the fact that there's a lot of confusion right now. A lot of us are scurrying to figure out what district we'd be in under these new maps. But I want to come back to the Jim Crow reference, because that suggests maybe there was actual racial animus. There was some intent here. Are you suggesting that? Because, as you know perfectly well, the Supreme Court won't touch it if there's gerrymandering just for politics. But they will if it's an issue of race. Well, the current standard as it relates to race in terms of uh, the Voting Rights Act, and in particular, Section 2, is not intent, but it's outcome. And what we've seen with respect to the New York maps is that the outcome is that the voices of communities of color 
and in districts that have long been represented by either African Americans or Latino members of the House have been decimated in this map put forward by an unelected out of town special master. So I'm not in a position to comment on intent, but I certainly can comment on outcome. And the outcome is problematic here, and anyone can see it. And the tactics that were apparently used, either intentionally or unintentionally, which resulted in four Black members of Congress being put into the same district with each other, Yvette Clark and myself in Brooklyn, Jamal Bowman and Mondaire uh, Jones in uh, Westchester County, that's problematic. Splitting the Bedford-Stuyvesant community, one of the most historic Black neighborhoods in America, in half when it's been part of a congressional district since 1968, when Shirley Chisholm once represented it, right. is problematic. And that's the concern. So, Congressman, if, in fact, there were uh, an alleged violation of Voting Rights Act of 1965, does that suggest further delays before we know what districts we're talking about? Because that, then, is a federal court issue, not something up to a state court. Well, it's interesting, because according to the New York State Constitution, uh, the special master was supposed to do several things. Respect federal law, respect the Voting Rights Act, respect communities of interest, and also respect the core of existing districts, none of which has happened. And in fact, many of the good government groups have even publicly said that the special master seemed not to have followed many of these constitutional dictates according to New York state law. And so on Friday, we'll get hopefully a revised map, but we'll all have to take a look at it. And I'm certain that there will be civil rights groups who are prepared to pursue litigation if necessary. Uh, Congressman, you, of course, are a senior member of leadership in the Congress on the Democratic side. I wonder what the challenges are right now for you in leadership, because one of the situations you referred to was Mondaire Jones, uh, a black new freshman congressman, actually, from Westchester County, now pitted against, actually, the head of the DCCC, Sean Patrick Maloney. And there are some that are suggesting that's something of a conflict of interest to have the head of the DCCC running against another Democrat. He declared quite quickly, are, is, the, is the leadership going to have to get involved in that and perhaps even remove uh, Mr. Maloney from his position? Well, collectively, in terms of the New York delegation, I'm confident uh, that we are going to work it all out to try to the best of our ability to avoid member on member primaries and give the voters an opportunity to elect the candidate of their choice moving forward in districts that they have historically and traditionally represented. So we're going to have to work through it uh, and see what the lines are like when revised uh, map comes out this Friday. Uh, but at the moment, what I've been encouraging everyone to do is let's make sure that our attention is focused on dealing with the flaws in the proposed map put forward by the special master. Uh, exactly when do people have to decide what they're running from? Because we had some people decide right quick which district they were going to run from. Well, according to... Uh, the court in Steuben County, uh, people, both current members as well as candidates, uh, will have until May 31st uh, to formally declare which district they decide to run in. So there's time, David, to be able to work through this, and certainly I encourage all of my colleagues to be able to do so. I also believe that Sean Patrick Maloney uh, has done a very good job getting us to this particular place, outraised our Republican counterparts, We've got incredible frontline candidates. We're going to be there to support them to make sure that they're successful in November. And finally, Congressman, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to something that's been reported in the press. And this is a bit of speculation, but perhaps part of the reason we're here at this present time is because there was originally a plan that some people said was gerrymandering. It was even challenged in court that would have really advantaged the Democrats. Is it possible that the Democrats overreached in the state of New York? Well, I think that the Court of Appeals certainly overreached. The whole narrative that the legislature, the elected representatives of the people of the state of New York overreached to me is false. Uh, you had the legislature pass a map uh, by super majorities in both the Assembly and the Senate signed into law by the governor. That was consistent with the constitutional requirement of a super majority in both houses. The fact that there were districts, uh, I believe 22, where Democrats would have an opportunity to win under the current map right now, there are 23 districts where we had an opportunity to win. And in fact, in 2018, 121 of those 23. So this was not a dramatic departure 
uh, from reality. And it was very problematic that the Court of Appeals took away the legislature's ability to correct any flaws that it concluded existed and instead assign the ability to a special master who, of course, doesn't know the difference between Bay Ridge, Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Brighton Beach. Yeah, exactly. Listen, thank you so much. That was a very helpful, for me at least, explanation of what's going on. It's very complicated, but that was really clearly done. Thank you. That's Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. He's Democrat of New York. Coming up on the eve of the leaders of Sweden and Finland visiting the White House, we're going to talk with former U.S. Ambassador to Poland. He's Daniel Fried. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West. And we want to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. Then we turn to Mark Crumpton here with the first word. David, thank you. Finland and Sweden have made it official. They have now applied for membership in NATO, a move that reshapes Europe's defenses. The two still must overcome opposition from Turkey's president, Recep Erdogan, who alleges that both countries support Kurdish militants whom Turkey sees as terrorists. There's another sign that the long battle at a steel mill in the Ukrainian city of Mariupol is coming to an end. Russia says that almost 1,000 Ukrainian troops have surrendered at that besieged factory. Their resistance against overwhelming odds brought them heroic status among Ukrainians. The world is no better prepared for a new pandemic than it was when COVID-19 emerged in 2019 and may actually be in a worse place given the economic toll. That's according to a panel set up by the World Health Organization to evaluate global response. Their study says a lack of progress on reforms such as international health regulations means the world is as vulnerable as ever. The U.S. Soccer Federation has become the first national governing body in the sport to promise its men's and women's team equal pay. That ends years of often acrimonious negotiations. The U.S. Federation also will pool international payments for the World Cup, so both men and women are paid equally for that competition. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, tomorrow, the leaders of Sweden and Finland are going to the White House to meet with President Biden, who issued a statement just today strongly supporting their request for admission to NATO, something he hopes will get through Congress relatively expeditiously. We welcome now somebody who knows Europe terribly well, has spent his career as a diplomat largely involved in Europe. He's Daniel Fried. He was a career diplomat who served as Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and also as U.S. Ambassador to Poland. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. I guess the most basic question is, what difference will it make if, in fact, Sweden and Finland are admitted to NATO? Sweden and Finland will bring military capacity to NATO. They will for, be able to foreclose Russian threats in the Baltic. Uh, they will be able to help with the defense of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And it will be a lesson to Putin and a lot of Russians that Putin's war against Ukraine has consequences. So it's a good thing, and I hope uh, Turkey doesn't block their membership in the end. I was just going to ask about that, because that seems to be the one possible fly in the ointment, as it were, which is Turkey. President Erdogan has expressed some reservations having to deal with Kurdish separatists. Uh, how real is that, or is that a bargaining chip? Does President Erdogan maybe want something else out of us? Well, it's real to the extent that Turkey takes the PKK, the Kurdish separatist and terrorist group, seriously. Uh, so they have a case, not against Finland and Sweden, but against the, PK, the PKK itself. Whether Erdogan, the Swedes, and the Finns can work out some arrangements, I can't say. But I'm fairly confident that the United States is going to support Finland and Sweden. And wherever we end up with Turkey's opposition to NATO membership for those countries, 
the security relationship between the United States and those countries is, go is going to be upgraded. The That's thing, pretty much guaranteed. The thing, of course, that's triggered all of this admission to NATO uh, that is likely to come is the war against Ukraine uh, really initiated exactly. by President Putin. Let's talk about what the allies, NATO and allies, are doing with respect to that, and specifically about an oil embargo. Much talked about. Hungary seems to be resisting it. How realistic is it to expect that Europe will have an embargo on oil from Russia? I think Europe is struggling to get a consensus and convince the Hungarians. However, my sense is that the Biden administration has is thinking about plan B. It's important that we go as we the West, US and Europe go after Putin's income stream. His number one export is oil, his number two export is gas. He's making money for his dirty war. We need to act. The United States is not simply waiting passively for the Europeans to make up their mind. They're thinking of ways that we can help the Europeans or take action so that Putin can't keep selling oil to finance his war. Let's hope the Europeans come to a solution. But it used to be the job of people like me in my last job in government was State Department sanctions coordinator. It used to be the our job to figure out ways around seemingly insurmountable obstacles. And I guess my question is, to what end? Uh, I think it's terribly important, you would know better than I, to be very specific about what the mission is. Is the mission here to defend Ukraine, to really preserve it as a sovereign state? Or is there a more profound mission here, which is actually to weaken Russia? I know that Secretary of Defense Austin triggered a lot of comment and some criticism when he said that that was a U.S. objective. But I'm on his side on this one. I think he was right. Putin has made not just one, but a couple of wars against his neighbors. That's enough. I don't want to see us defend Ukraine successfully or help Ukraine defend itself successfully, only to see that Putin rearms, rebuilds, and go, starts another war in a few years. I think we need to help the Ukrainians win, by which I mean get the Russians out of Ukraine. As much of it as possible, and certainly... Uh, back to the line of contact before the latest offensive began in February. But it's also a perfectly legitimate objective to deprive Putin of the resources so he can start another war. You want to go through this all again in a couple of years? I don't. It doesn't mean that a diplomatic solution isn't desirable or possible. But let's not be too hurried to, to push Ukraine to give away its own territory when we know what that means for the people who live there. Yeah, and for that Murder, matter, terror. For that matter, it's not clear how much leeway President Zelensky would have with his own people right now to give away territory, given the way it's gone. At the same time, I'm not aware in recent history of a lot of instances where President Putin backed down in a very public setting, confrontation such as this. Is it realistic to expect that at some point he would change his mind and say, OK, it didn't work? Or are we talking about regime change? Either. It's not a question of regime change. That's not our policy, and it shouldn't be our policy. But it's not a question of Putin changing his mind. It's a question of Putin's armies losing momentum, failing to, to gain more territory and failing to hold the territory. It's not a question of his goodwill. It's a question of reality. And right now, I'm in Poland. I'm in Warsaw. Right now, the United States, Poland, the UK, many other European countries, including Germany and France, are uh, organizing a major logistics effort to supply Ukraine with the weapons it needs to defend itself. This is a serious operation. Mm. And the Ukrainians may succeed. That's a pretty big deal, mm. a pretty big success for the United States, for the West, for Ukraine, and for democracy, defending itself against tyranny, quite frankly. It doesn't mean that Ukraine will necessarily win. Right. It means they might win. And because they might win, we have a responsibility, and it is in our interests, to make, help them make the most of those chances. Yeah, and it's quite a change, actually, because I'm not sure many of us on February 24th would have said that was possible, but now people are seriously considering it. Thank you so That's much, Mr. For Ambassador. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Ambassador, so much. That's Daniel Fried. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Poland. Coming up, retail under siege. We go through the turmoil in the markets today with Kriti Gupta. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. 
Earnings season continues. The shares getting massacred. That's stock up 20%. The shares have been all over the place. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Netflix is losing customers in three out of four of its regions. Disney Plus dodges the streaming slump. With exclusive expert analysis. You've got to parse each and every company. Quantity is a sea of green. No wonder we got inflation on our minds. To see this app performance compared to Netflix. It's surpassing pre-pandemic levels. Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the markets are in turmoil, particularly equity markets today, with right now the NASDAQ down over three and three quarters percent and the S&P 500 down uh, over three percent. And it may have been triggered perhaps by some of the retail numbers we've seen. To explain all that to us, we welcome now Kriti Gupta. Kriti? Yeah, I mean, this is all about the consumer. But remember, stocks and futures were down before even the target results came out. But this is important as we talk about this broader move that you're seeing in terms of whether or not recession and demand destruction should be a bigger part of the conversation. Let's just dive right into the target earnings because, sure, you did see a massive miss, um, or I should say a massive miss when it comes to their outlook. In particular, a lot of them saying that the higher margins are really going to squeeze it. But, David, what really caught my eye is higher inventories. They said what was eating into their margins was headcount and compensation, not in their stores, but in their distribution centers. For our TV audience, for our radio audience, stick with me, but for our TV audience, you're looking at a chart here that shows the inventory to sales spread for some of the major retailers, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, uh, Target as well. And what it essentially shows more recently is this massive spike up in inventories relative to sales. What that tells you here is that there's this kind of buildup that you're starting to see. And the question is, there isn't enough demand to actually pull those inventories out. So to me, yes, we're seeing this kind of squeeze on the margins and squeeze on the profit outlook. But talk about the long term story here. You have inventories that are getting built up at a time when supply chain issues are are all uh, coming to kind of a forefront. And on top of that, demand slowing. So what do you do with that extra product? Well, this is a really important point. If we're switching from a supply problem to a demand problem, which is yeah. what you're suggesting here, at the same time, you have to put price in the equation as well. You might also be seeing the Fed's working its magic, as it were, because it wants to get inflation down. If prices go up too much, they always say the best solution for high prices is high prices. Yeah. <laughs> well, it says that there's no other alternative in terms of kind of squishing the economy, for, for lack of a better term. It's also important to keep in mind that when you are talking about this kind of inflationary environment, it's pretty normal to see the Federal Reserve tack or try yeah. to target the markets. And I think that fear is what you're seeing in the S&P 500 today broadly. And if the prices go up, people don't buy as much stuff, maybe. And it's possible. Right. Okay. Thank you so much to Kriti Gupta for that report on what I've said is very tumultuous markets today. Coming up, will Europe embargo Russian oil? And what are the alternatives? We talk with Amrita Sen of Energy Aspects. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, energy remains very much at the top of the agenda as we continue to have inflated oil prices, possibilities of embargoes over in Europe, and the question of whether more capacity can come online. We welcome now a true expert in this area. She's Amrita Sen, founder of Energy Aspects. So, Amrita, thanks so much for joining us. Let's start with Europe, if we could, uh, and the prospects of a possible sure. European oil embargo on Russia. Not clear that'll happen. Hungary's reluctant. But I guess my question is, is is there further upside risk to the price in crude right now because of what might happen with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, ultimately, we do think Europe wants to do an embargo, regardless of uh, all the headlines we've seen yesterday about the U.S., um, you know, trying to propose a tariff instead of an embargo. Of course, a tariff would be less uh, disruptive uh, because, you know, it just means the price of oil would for, for Europe to import from Russia would be much, much higher. But equally, Russia could discount its oil and still send it, right? Uh, so the U.S. is proposing that because, of course, inflation is a big uh, big talking point everywhere, really, in the world, but particularly in the U.S. ahead of the midterms. Uh, but from our understanding and our sources, Europe still wants the embargo. Uh, the meeting on the 30th and 31st of May in Brussels is going to be the key one to watch out for. Hungary ultimately wants concessions, um, and Europe is working on it, exactly how that kind 
kind of pans out remains to be seen. Uh, but we still believe that an embargo is on the cards. If, in fact, there were an embargo, do you have any sense of how hot the price of oil could go? I mean, look, the embargo doesn't hit oil straight away, right? Because this is going to be a phased embargo. It will take about six months uh, to really uh, phase this out. So that upside comes at the end of the year because by that time, the SPR, the IEA and uh, US SPR, uh, will also have ended. I mean, uh, we've already seen oil prices around $115, $120 per barrel. But let's remember, if you talk about the price of oil, what you and I are paying for, whether it be gas diesel or jet fuel, that's already above 160, 180, in some cases even 200. So we are already there. It's just a question of the combination of crude plus products, why or which one you're looking at. But crude could easily go to 150 on its own uh, if, you know, things really tighten up towards year end and further SPR releases don't happen. Now, we do think there will probably be more SPR releases, uh, but ultimately it's still finite, right? You do run out of SPR. Uh, and I think that's when you ultimately you need demand to come off to balance this market. And Marita, let me move over briefly to the question of natural gas in Europe as well, because we now have the mm -hmm. EU, the European Union, saying you cannot pay in rubles. Russia saying you have to pay in rubles. I saw a report in the Financial Times today saying that maybe any was going to defy that order. Where do we sit right now with natural gas supplies and the question of whether they can be paid in rubles. I mean, this has been going on for some time, but not just uh, any, like you said, but us, quite a few others have also come out and said that they, the payments will continue. Um, special arrangements, you know, you have to pay into Gazprom Bank, uh, which then uh, converts it into ruble and uh, sends it to Russia. Um, so we think that will continue. We've highlighted there's about nine BCM of uh, potential gas contracts that could get closed off before the end of the year because they're up for renewal. But the bulk of it, like well over 30 BCM, will still continue and the payments will just take place regardless of uh, EU saying that they can't be paid in rubles. And Marita, if in fact there's further curtailment of the purchase of oil or gas from Russia, uh, there's the natural question of, okay, where might that oil or gas come from? What substitutes are they? Start with the United States. Producers here have been fairly disciplined in saying we're not going to ramp back, back up again. Do you expect that to continue? Or at some point with the, with the prices escalated, should we see a ramp up in U.S. production? U.S. production is rising. It's just that it's not rising by anywhere close to what it used to at, say, $100 oil. Uh, part of it is producer discipline, as we've seen, and we've just come out of earnings season. Regardless of, you know, prices being close to $100, guidance didn't really go up at all, barring one or two of the oil majors, and I think that is really telling. Uh, but also, I think even if they wanted to, Oil field services is the biggest constraint right now. When I was there just a few weeks ago, you could, like, even in the Midland at, at a frac site, you, you could see how short labor was, equipment, uh, steel, cement, you know, 55% of global casing is Russian steel. Uh, so I think th there's some genuine tightness in oil field services that's perhaps being underappreciated, regardless of what happens to prices um, and capital discipline. U.S. producers will really struggle to raise production this year. Next year, they've started to place orders for rigs in advance, so things could get a little bit better. And that's where capital discipline comes in more so than this year, I'd say. And Marita, last time I checked, the largest proven reserves were actually in Venezuela, which has largely been closed off. At the same time, there are announcements mm -hmm. now that the U.S. may be backing off on some of the sanctions, permitting more activity. Is it realistic to expect Venezuelan crude to come into the market and help some of the problem? Look, I mean, these are very early days. Yes, some headlines that some economic sanctions could be lifted um, and, you know, potentially Chevron could get some preferential treatment where they could get some of the oil back to the U.S., but very, very early days. The biggest issue with Venezuela is that uh, the damage that's been done to the upstream over the past decade or so, if not longer, decades really, uh, is huge. I mean, PDVSA's own documents will say you need tens of billions of dollars to really get production up and running. So uh, maybe even if, again, that's a big if, but even if all uh, sanctions get lifted in the near term, um, maybe production rises by a few hundred thousand barrels per day to three hundred thousand or maybe max five hundred thousand anything more than that is going to take years and that's the problem and again I repeat we are nowhere close to being uh, or we're nowhere close to saying that all economic sanctions or all sanctions overall including oil are going to get lifted these are just small steps to see how the next kind of 
potential talks progress. One last one here, Amrita. We've been talking about crude oil. There, are, of course, there are the refined products, which are related but somewhat different. We've had a real constraint, as I understand it, in the capacity to refine. And as a result, you've got a real spread now of things like diesel and jet fuel. Is there any prospect yes. of increasing capacity in refining in the medium term to relieve some of that pressure? Well, like I was saying, right, crude could be 115, but diesel and jet has been closer to like $200. Uh, look, in the near term, we've obviously closed down almost 3 million barrels per day of refining capacity in the Atlantic Basin uh, during COVID and even now because of ESG pressures. China's policy has changed. It doesn't export as much products as it used to, and that's why these pressures are going to stay. From now on, we've, we are finishing up refinery maintenance, so some of the acute pressure that we are feeling will ease off in the coming months, but fundamentally or structurally, I should say, we are going to be short. There are some new refineries starting up in the Middle East, one potentially in Nigeria and one in Mexico over the medium term, but they are going to be nowhere close to meeting the oil demand growth that we are forecasting. You really need a deep, deep recession for oil demand to decline outright, and only then will you be able to balance the market. So the ESG pressures are really hampering downstream investment and uh, you know refining right now, which is a big concern for the global economy, really. I should say, Amrita, this has been terribly helpful. Thank you so much for your time. That's Amrita Sen of Energy Aspects. Coming up, we get a recap of those primaries yesterday with our resident expert, Mark Niket. Plus, we're going to speak with crack pollster Frank Luntz to explain what we learned about the voters in those races. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. some other individuals who are in actually unbelievably close friends, made a big difference in my life, were always there at every moment. Let's start with 45, President Trump. Yeah. Yeah. President Trump, after he endorsed me, continued to lead into this race in Pennsylvania. He knows all the subtleties of it. That was someone we know well. It's Mehmet Oz, the doctor who's been on television daytime for some time thanking President Trump. But that was not a victory speech because it ain't over yet. All eyes were on the Pennsylvania state primaries yesterday and particularly on that Senate race for the Republicans. National political reporter Mark Niquette joins us from Pennsylvania with the latest. I guess the latest is how far are they apart right now? How many votes do they still have to count? Well, last time I checked, it's about 2,500 votes separating Dr. Oz and uh, David McCormick with the uh, uh, Dr. Oz holding a slight lead. We don't know exactly how many ballots are, are still outstanding, but we're thinking it's in the 20,000 range. Um, so we're, we still have a ways to go and, and Pennsylvania has an automatic recount if the margin is within half percentage point and we're definitely in that territory. So Mark, to jump ahead, it sounds like it's gonna be a while before we're likely to know the result here. Yeah, I think so. We're, we're, we're still dealing with uh, votes being counted from election day, as well as mail-in ballots uh, that were cast for this election. Pennsylvania, unfortunately, has a law that doesn't require, doesn't allow counties to begin processing and counting mail-in ballots until 7 a.m. of election day, unlike other states like Florida, uh, that they can process their mail-in ballots ahead of time so you can get the count on election night. Pennsylvania, we have to wait, and the county boards of elections sometimes take days to count these uh, mail-in ballots. So, we're going to be processing these mail-in ballots for a couple of days, I think, uh, and we might need those totals to, to get to declare a winner. So, Mark, you had Mehmet Oz against uh, Dave McCormick. On policies, I'm not sure how much of a difference there was between them. And by the way, even from Ms. Barnett, uh, who was the third runner there, uh, they all just were sort of disagreeing about how much they were with Donald Trump. They aren't necessarily centrist. In the meantime, you have John Fetterman over on the Democrat side, who has been uh, close to Bernie Sanders. Is it going to be important in the general election for somebody to try to move to the center? Yeah, I think so. Pennsylvania is still a purple state, still a swing state, um, where uh, the votes of uh, independents and centrists matter. Um, the, the Republicans were uh, deathly afraid that uh, Kathy Barnett, the, the further right candidate uh, in that Senate primary, would get nominated because their thought would it be much harder for her to uh, defeat John Fetterman. Uh, but you're right, we're going to have kind of an interesting uh, election uh, in the fall, no matter what, but with uh, Fetterman, who's a little more progressive. Uh, and probably uh, a Dr. Oz or, or a, a McCormick, who are maybe a little more centrist. 
Okay, that's our national political reporter, Mark Niquette, reporting from Pennsylvania. Thanks so much, Mark. Now we want to turn to the famed pollster and strategist Frank Lund, CEO of FIL, Inc., whom we always turn to when we need to understand what happened in an election. So, Frank, give us, first of all, the Pennsylvania Republican primary. What did we learn from that, if anything? Well, we learned that Donald Trump is still essential, that he is the number one force within the GOP. When he endorses, it has an impact. But we also saw that it doesn't necessarily carry you all the way through in every state. For example, the most Trumpian member of Congress, Madison Cawthorn, in North Carolina, lost his primary narrowly. If you, as you viewers will remember, uh, uh, the congressman had said some very controversial accusations against other Republicans, and he was himself uh, not everyone's cup of tea. In other places, in other races, in North Carolina, which is one I've been following, the Trump-endorsed candidate won overwhelmingly against the former governor. And when you endorse a congressional candidate against a former governor, that's having an impact. So in, it, it doesn't, Trump moves numbers. He moves and changes outcomes, but it varies by state. Uh, the, another race I was watching was the lieutenant governor in Idaho was challenging the governor, also had a Trump endorsement. And in that case, the governor got reelected. So I still believe that Donald Trump is the most major force, is the most significant, but he can't win in every state and every race. And this is winning primaries. Uh, do we have That's any correct. sense of what it means for the general? Yes, I do. And actually, for as good as Trump is in winning primaries, he is as bad in winning generals. And what the Republicans are going to have to face in a place like Pennsylvania is that he's gold in a Republican electorate. But when you move to Democrats and independents, Donald Trump is very disliked, and he will actually cost votes in the general election. It's, a, it's an equation that a lot of Republicans have to decide as they seek his endorsement. Uh, let's talk also for a moment about some of the governor's races, particularly in Pennsylvania, because one of the big issues is our people, I've just seen this term now, election deniers. That is to say, the 2020 election was not properly decided. There was something illegitimate. We have now on the Republican side a candidate for governor who both denies the outcome in 2020, but also says he would like to re-register every voter in the state of Pennsylvania. Pen Commonwealth, I should say, Pennsylvania. First off, that's expensive. I mean, who's going to pay for it? And secondly, voters traditionally... And I apologize, but this is, I'm speaking to you from the Houses of Parliament, and it is very loud here. Well, I, I hope Parliament's okay there behind you. I'm worried about them. <laughs> well, I, I, think they're, I think they're doing just fine. And if they're being taken away, then I think voters would be pretty happy with it. There's the same kind of frustration in the UK that we have in the US. The, the issue in the end is whether you're looking forward or looking backward. And voters traditionally, by about three to one, are choosing candidates based on what they're going to do for them versus what they have done either uh, against them in the past. And so I don't think that this is a constructive uh, campaign thing for any candidate to be arguing about what happened in 2020 other than in a Republican primary. Uh, Frank, I, I don't want to let you go without talking about what's going on in the state of New York with the redistricting, because it, it seems to be pretty much of a mess on the Democrat side. They had what some people call the gerrymandered plan to sort of gain some seats. It's been thrown out now. Now they're in the last stages, and they're really going after each other. They're almost eating their own. What is happening here? It's This could determine who controls the House. Because up to this point, even though states, Republican states, won electoral votes and they, and they added congressional seats, the places where it was added was in urban areas, which are Democratic areas. So as you look at the count, actually, Democrats got a three or four seat advantage in redistricting when all is said and done. New York changes that. The initial maps were absolutely brutal for the Republicans. They were thrown out for gerrymandering, as they should have been. And now the new maps are actually beneficial to the GOP rather than the Democrats. You could see a four or even five seat swing because of the old maps being thrown out and the new maps being adopted. And I'm not surprised, because right now there are half a dozen congressmen, including two chairmen, two committee chairmen, that are going to go up against each other. And this is for control of the United States House of Representatives. 
I think the next, the rest of this week is going to be brutal politically. So, Frank, for some of us who are not as versed in this as you are, we take a look at it right now and say the Democrats are going to have a tough time in November anyway. Right now, they don't seem to be headed in the right direction. Play it from your point of view, because you talk to so many voters all the time. Is there anything the Democrats could do right now to turn this thing around? Yes, they have to focus on results. They have to acknowledge that inflation is what it is, and they actually have to do, have to have those elements of policy that can impact people. So we had, for example, the Biden administration infrastructure plan, which passed uh, in a bipartisan fashion. He has to be able to show that within the first year, you have a meaningful, measurable difference in the lives of, of people from across the country. Otherwise, people are going to complain about inflation. They're going to complain, complain about crime. They're going to play, complain about uh, immigration. And those issues are really bothering people in their day-to-day -day lives. And frankly, I, I would not want to be a Democratic strategist right now because you're going to have to explain to people, be patient. And when you're having trouble making ends meet, when you're having trouble putting gas in your gas tank, you're not for delaying. You want change. You want your life to be better right now. One last quick one, Frank. Uh, is blaming it all on Putin going to work? No. No, you have to take, you have to be candid with people. And this is where Joe Biden used to be, used to have a great reputation as someone who was a centrist, as someone who was, who believed in common sense and responsible government. Quite frankly, the left of the Democratic Party has made his job much more difficult. And I actually think that the left of the Democratic Party could cost them the House and even possibly the Senate. Frank, so great to get to talk to you from the Houses of Parliament. That's a special treat. Thank you so much to Frank Luntz, that famed pollster. He is the head of FIL, Inc. Coming up here, U.S. stocks are taking a beating. More on the equity sell-off is coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We're going to wrap up the program today on the markets where we started out because they are really in turmoil. We welcome back now Abigail Doolittle to bring us up to speed on what we're seeing. So where are we at the moment? We're slightly off the lows, but that means we're down 2.8 percent for the S&P 500. So there's still some sizable pain there for the Nasdaq 100, uh, down even more, down 3.6 percent. And the Dow Transports, which we mentioned before, down a little bit less than 6 percent. That's the worst day since June of 2020. That's the degree of the selling power. And it really has much to do with Target, with that horrible quarter relative to earnings, the big miss, the operating miss. And margins miss and then the operating margins guide down to six percent from eight percent on the year that's a monster move in and it really has to do with rising costs relating that to the dow transports trucking under pressure logistics so there's a lot of bleed through but the thing that's most interesting about it target itself down 24 percent the worst day as you know since 1987 it's not priced in everybody's surprised by this even in this awful year for stocks yeah, and you just wonder, we thought that there were going to be increased costs, but we kept hearing about pricing power and pricing power. I guess if investors start thinking people don't have the pricing power, that might affect the valuation. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, because last year the question was pricing power, pricing yeah. power, when will inflation finally weigh? It didn't seem to happen, didn't seem to happen, maybe selectively, but now you have two of the biggest companies in the world, most well-managed companies, Walmart and Target, uh, saying that this is a big surprise and a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Is this going to be a problem for other companies? And in terms of the consumer, as you know, sales beat, so the consumer demand was there, but not so much on the discretionary items within Target. It was more on food and fuel, similar to Walmart. Abigail, you you like to look at the longer term trends, uh, which is really uh, helpful. Uh, last Friday, as I left Bloomberg about seven o'clock at night, it was all about the bear market rally. That's what we were seeing. If you were, the stocks came up, that's what we were going to see. It. Is this what happens in a bear market rally, or do we not have the bear market rally? So it's a, that's a great question. So a bear market rally, in my mind, is generally not one day. So that was a nice yeah. pop. And I think there was one other day last week where it was a little bit strong. Yesterday, we had a nice rally. We have to put a few more days together. Whether or not that happens, it's unclear. But from a technical perspective, that longer perspective that you're talking about, the real drag on this market right now, it is actually consumer discretionary. That is the worst sector on the year, also having to do with Amazon and Tesla. Uh, but it suggests that there could be uh, more declines ahead. It looks it looks bearish. Well, it's quite a day with the three hours left to go. Thanks so much to Abigail Doolittle on the markets. Check out the Balance Power newsletter on the terminal and online. Coming up, Balance of Power will continue on Bloomberg Radio. Please join us in our second hour. And this is Balance of Power. We're on Bloomberg Television and on radio.